Another uh, announcement. Another announcement that uh, Terry handed to me is if the Dreamers from Texas are going to meet at Senator Cruz's Houston office and shame his bullying tactics. He shouldn't be such a bully against the immigrant community and reminding him of his own immigrant history. And that's going to be at his uh, Houston office, uh, 1919 Smith Street, at 1130 on Thursday, August 14th. Uh, something that we thought of, Houston's a pretty good drive. So everyone ought to call the INS office and tell them that there's going to be a bunch of illegals and we'd like to report where they're going to be and what time they'll be there. And we would appreciate an agent to be there to uh, apprehend them and end up deporting them. Uh, you know, and it brought up another thing, made me think of another thing, too. You know, I've heard our school districts can tell us how many children are attending our public schools and how many of those children are here illegally. Well, if we know how many are here illegally, we know what address they're li living at, we know their parents are here illegally, uh, why are they still in our school districts? That, that's always kind of bothered me. That's kind of along the same lines. Uh, if y'all will humor me, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant. Uh, I've heard some things. I, I try not to do this often. Mike, I apologize. I'm not the scheduled speaker, but I'll get it done in plenty of time. Uh, I, I was at an event the other night, and, and I heard something that really got me. I, I, I heard a, a, a state senator a candidate make the comment that the federal government was not doing anything about the border. They were fault, uh, you know, faltering on their duty to take care of this border situation. And that the state uh, was going to have to take it in their own hand and act. But, which I don't disagree with that state. What, what got me is this was interrupted by a congressman. And the congressman's comments were, it wasn't their fault. It's not the Congress's job. It's the president's job. Well, I think our congressman may need to read his constitution. But anyway, I, I put Article Article One of the Constitution deals with the duties of the Congress. All right, and I put up the clauses here that that actually uh, pertain to this issue because I, I really disagree with this. I, I'm tired of this. You know, we're seeing it on all sides. It's not my fault, it's their fault. It's not the president's fault, it's the Congress's fault. It's not the House's fault, it's the Senate's fault. It's Bush's fault. It, but you know, leaders don't do that. At some point, leaders quit pointing the finger and say, this issue's not being taken care of, and so I'm going to stand up and lead in this area. And, and that's why I really, it, it, it didn't really bother me. And here's why. Clearly, in the Constitution, Article 1, this is Section 8, the enumerated powers. This is what the government is supposed to do and the Congress is supposed to do. And it says that, under Clause 4, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. Okay, naturalization. You can look at this several ways, and I've studied it and looked, went and looked at some cases. You can take the position that naturalization and immigration are two separate issues. And that naturalization is the realm of the federal government, which that then would leave immigration up to the states. Now, if you want to look at it that way, then Congress would only, Congress, not the president, would be in charge of uniform rules of naturalization. But there's been a lot of precedent over the years that the states have ceded, ceded their authority on that on immigration to the federal government. So my scenario two, if we use that view, okay, naturalization slash immigration are related issues that are both under the federal government's preview. If we use that, then the Congress is responsible for naturalization and immigration, if that's the, the view we're going to use on that, and that would be the common view now. But Congress still has to take the action. All right? Number three. Well, that's number three.
3 on Pump. In Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, it is the Congress's job. Okay, Article 1 is the Congress. Article 2 is President, 3 is the Judiciary. Article 1, it is the job, Congress's job, to provide for the calling forth the militia, <clears throat> to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Now, if, if from what I'm seeing, this would appear to be an invasion of our country. Now, albeit not necessarily a hostile military invasion, but an invasion nonetheless. <clears throat> Therefore, I'm going to have to strongly disagree with the congressman on what he said. It is the Congress's job to call for the militia to repel that invasion. Okay, so they have to legislate that he do that, he, that he does that. If at that point he does not do that, then now they have a case. You know what? If he's not doing his, his constitutional duty, there is a remedy for that, and it's called impeachment. All right, so that, that's just that, that was my little soapbox about what I heard the other night at an event. All right, now I, I've got another rant. <laughs> I've been in the insurance business a long time. My dad been in it. Fit, yeah, <laughs> right. Okay. Now, if I understand, and anybody correct me if I'm wrong, because I was questioning it, maybe I am. But the way I understand this lawsuit that the Republican House is carrying out against President Obama. And everyone knows how I feel about him and his overreaches and what we should do. But I have a real problem with this. I have a real problem with this. Because the way I understand it, we are suing him over not implementing the employer mandates and the rest of Obamacare. Now, if I'm wrong, y'all please tell me, for four years, I've heard nothing. But we need to repeal Obamacare out of our house. I've heard Obamacare is going to destroy our economy. I've heard they're going to dictate our medicine. And we all agree with that. We do not want that. So let me just put this in perspective as the way I understand it. This is a lose-lose. This is a lose-lose situation. Number one, if we bring this lawsuit, and we lose it, then we have just opened the door to future presidents and this president to execute even more executive power over our Congress. Okay? That's if we lose the lawsuit. Scenario two, we win the lawsuit. You destroy the economy of the United States, subject all you to Obamacare, immediately, for what? For what? It's a lose-lose. We have told the man for years, don't implement it, don't implement it. Okay, y'all are right, I won't implement it right now. No, we're going to sue you and make you implement it. I'm really confused. I, this, this lawsuit really has me upset. Uh, we're doing it all this to prove a political point, and they think it's going to help their political future. But either way, we lose. We lose either way. Either we get a more powerful executive, or we all get subjected to Obamacare now. And everything else in it is going to be forced now. All right. Just bear with me, Mike. I'm nearly done. Uh, this comes from Ross that works for Michael Quinn Sullivan. And this was interesting to me. This is what we're actually up against. All right. This is what we're really up against. <clears throat> we as Texas Republicans still have not replaced one redistribution bailout voting representative. Y'all know that? We still have it. But what this, this is my point. Paul did not vote for the bailout. There was a representative in East Texas, Ralph Hall, that he was, I believe, 95 years old. He used to be a Democrat. He switched parties. And they unseated him this last go-round in the primary. All right? But here's the kicker. Hall did not vote for the bailout. Hall did not vote for the stimulus. Hall didn't vote to increase the debt ceiling. I'm not sure, I'm not, you know, maybe the next guy will be better. I know, that's not. But he didn't vote for any of those things. But anyway, be that as it may, Hall's laws marked the first election in which a sitting Republican U.S. representative from the great red conservative state of Texas 
failed to obtain his own party's renomination in state history. In other words, Rad Radcliffe's victory over Hall was the first time that any sitting Republican in the House was defeated in the primary after 257 unsuccessful attempts. I know two of those were mine. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but this is what we're up against, folks. The, the, the records, I mean, we're, we're, we replaced a man that we have far worse in the state of Texas that voted for debt ceiling raises, that voted for Bella. We just keep putting them in. I'm going to find the only reason Mr. Hall lost is he was 95 and he couldn't get out on the campaign trail too well. I mean, that, that would be my take from this. But that's all we're up against. Look, I'm a lifelong Republican. Everyone knows that. I, you know, conservative, I'm a little bit right of the till of the hunt. I, I understand that. <laughs> But you know, we need to quit worrying about this Democrat, Republican, and whether the state's this color or that. I tell you what, Texas has turned awful purple. Awful purple. I, you know, I always think it's the choir, but I look and I don't find redistribution in the conservative hymnal. But it seems like in Texas, the Republican Party. We're seeing the redistribution stall pretty much on key here. And so we need to look at that. You know, we need to quit worrying about that. And we need conservatives to win. We need constitutionalists to win. That's what we need. We need to quit worrying about that and start worrying about right and wrong again. Not, not whether this guy's got the right hair to win or, or, you know what, about right and wrong. And we need to start worrying about really, I think, for example, I happen to know, I've looked at their deal, I believe my congressman votes with the Constitution 52% of the time. Well, we need congressmen that vote with the Constitution 98% of the time. Actually, for, for me, being right at the top of the hunt, it's being right at the top of the hunt. And something, when we talk to these kids and you try to get new people involved, don't go talk to them about Republican, Democrat. You know what you need to go talk to them about? You need to go talk to them about freedom and liberty. Because that crosses all party lines, crosses all socioeconomic groups, <coughs> all races, all ethnic backgrounds. Talk about freedom and liberty. You start all this stuff that we hear on Fox News, this Democrat, that, they go, they tune you right out. But start talking to them about freedom. I'll tell you something else we need to worry about and you can talk to them about. Start talking to them, and you better start, I'm worried about it, what the Fed is doing to the value of our currency. And what's going to happen there? That, that's one of the biggest threats we face, folks. I mean, we're going to have Vic here, Trader Vic here, from Dallas, a uh, couple of meetings. Great guy. We went over, looked at Ryan's budget and everything. You know, we're to the point now, even if we do things right, it would be hard to ever get out of this step. You know, balancing the budget is a first step to, to pay off the debt. You have to run a surplus. So just balancing budget does not fix the problem. <laughs> so that's some of the things I think we need to worry about. I'm going to get out of the way. we got Mike Mike here from Oklahoma. Uh, he's here with John Burke Society. Your time's up. Yeah. <laughs> and Mike, I was going to do it. Hey, I, I won't filibuster anymore. I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Let him tell you a little bit about himself and start it. He has some things uh, to share with us on it. Bob, and you know, something I asked Mike, and I'm sure he's going to cover it, is that we be sure to cover some of the paths of the JBS. Uh, JBS. Awful reputation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the one thing I can't figure, Mike, I, I'm not really sure where I, I, I disagree with you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it does happen. Anyway, I'm going to get out of the way and let Mike take over. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. Y'all are uh, wonderful. It's always good to come to Texas. I live in Oklahoma. Um, I originally was raised in the state of Connecticut, good conservative Republican state. Uh, I tell people I got here as fast as I could. Okay. But anyway, I live in Oklahoma now, and I'm the coordinator for the John Burt Society for Oklahoma, North Texas, and Western Arkansas in my spare time. How many of you know that North Texas is bigger than most European countries? <laughs> Just want to let you know if you didn't know that it is. It's huge. 
Anyway, I covered a lot of ground. Um, I'm really delighted to be here tonight, and we will talk about the reputation of the Burt Society. We'll talk about various things. Uh, first, we're going to show a DVD for about 30 minutes. What this DVD does, it's called Overview of America. We've it's been seen over 10 million times. You will find it embedded in Liberty websites. Groups will take it. Of course, you know, they don't tell anybody that it came from us, but you'll be watching it and you'll go, hey, wait a minute, that's Overview of America. Um, it's a great DVD. Lots and lots of people have seen it. School kids have seen it. Uh, it defines terms, it defines governmental terms, it defines economic terms, boils it down in 30 minutes. I learned more on that DVD than I learned all the way through all the civics classes in high school and everything else. But then again, I wasn't a very good student, so maybe I'm not a good you know, example. But anyway, please watch the DVD and then we'll talk afterwards, okay? God gave man his rights. 
and that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in the very next sentence, the founders defined the proper role of government when they stated that to secure these rights, governments are instituted. This is the entire philosophical base of our nation. Here the government cannot legitimately redistribute the wealth, assume power over the people's lives, and dominate man's existence with oppressive taxation, regulations, and controls. According to the founders, government was to be a negative force, which leaves people alone. Its sole function is to protect citizens from one another and from foreign governments, and especially from their own government itself. The founders did not create a government to be a positive force to do things for people, to take from some, to give to others. They understood that when a government starts doing something for one citizen, it has to take from another to do so. And in the process, it gains control over both. So our forefathers had to fight a war to make it stick. By 1783, the war for independence had been won, and British forces were sent back across the sea. But the governmental system at that time was weak. It had no power to settle disputes between the states, nor the power to tax for proper needs, such as national defense. So in 1787, delegates from 12 of the 13 states met in Philadelphia to revise the system and they produced an entirely new governmental structure known as the Constitution of the United States. Keeping faith with the thunderous assertions in the Declaration, the Constitution was written to govern the government, not the people, and not the states, each of which was a jealous guardian of its own sovereignty. The founders created a central government with strictly limited powers. This left the states free to compete with one another, to be the best state, the one with the least amount of taxation and controls, one where citizens would want to build a business and raise a family. That spirit of competition produced excellence, as honest competition always does. It's important to note that the Constitution wasn't forced on the people. It was sent back to the states for ratification, and several of the founding fathers wrote essays explaining in an effort to persuade fellow Americans to adopt this new system of government. Some of the essays written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay were collected into a volume known as the Federalist Papers. Those essays provide valuable insights into the intent of the founders in establishing our government. Eventually, all 13 states ratified the Constitution, and then each ratified the first 10 amendments known as the Bill of Rights, further tying the hands of the federal government. These amendments are indeed about rights. But it would have been better had the Bill of Rights been labeled the Bill of Limitations on Government. Why? Because it's vital to realize that the Bill of Rights never gave citizens any rights whatsoever. Its sole purpose was to safeguard God-given rights by limiting government power. The Founders even insisted that Congress shall make no law about speech, religion, the press, assembly, the right to petition, the right to keep and bear arms, and so on. These amendments are directed squarely at the federal government, not the individual and not the states. They are like most of the Ten Commandments, which are essentially thou shalt nots. The Bill of Rights says Congress shall not, shall not, shall not, all the way up to the marvelous Tenth Amendment, which says in effect, if we forgot anything, you can't do that either. <laughs> When Benjamin Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention, he was asked by a woman, Sir, what have you given us? His immediate response was, A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Yet most Americans today have been persuaded that our nation's governmental system is a democracy and not a republic. The difference between these two is essential in understanding Americanism and the American system. Before we discuss political systems, however, it's helpful to address the confusion that has been spread about the political spectrum. Many have been led to believe that the political spectrum places groups such as communists on the far left, fascists or dictators on the far right, and political moderates or centrists in the middle. <coughs> However, a more accurate political spectrum will show government having zero power on the far right to having 100% power on the far left. At the extreme right, there is no government. The extreme left features total government, 
under such labels as communism, socialism, Nazism, fascism, princes, potentates, dictators, kings, any form of total government. Those who claim that Nazis and fascists are right-wing never define their terms. This amounts to spreading confusion. Toward the middle of the political spectrum can be found a type of government limited to its proper role of protecting the rights of the people. That's where the Constitution of the United States is. Those who advocate such a form of government are really constitutional moderates. So let's analyze the basic forms of government. They are monarchy or dictatorship ruled by one, oligarchy ruled by a few, democracy ruled by a majority, republic ruled by law, and anarchy, which is ruled by no one. In discussing these five, we'll see that they can be narrowed down to even fewer. Looking first at monarchy or dictatorship, this form of government doesn't really exist in a practical sense. It's always a group that puts one of its members up front. A king has his council of nobles or earls, and every dictator has his bureaucrats or commissars, the men behind the scenes. This isn't ruled by one, even though one person may be the visible leader. It's ruled by a group. So let's eliminate monarchy, dictatorship, because it never truly exists. <coughs> Oligarchy, which is ruled by a group, is the most common form of government in all history. And it is the most common form of government today. Most of the nations of the world are ruled by a powerful few. And therefore, oligarchy remains. At the other end, we find anarchy, which means without government. Some people have looked over history and found that many of its worst crimes were committed by governments. So they decided that having no government might be a good idea. But this is a mistake. Because as the ancient Greeks stated, without law, there can be no freedom. Our founding fathers agreed and held that some amount of government is a necessary force in any civilized, orderly society. In a state of anarchy, however, everyone has to guard life, liberty, and property, and the lives of family members. Everyone must be armed, and movement is severely restricted because one's property has to be protected at all times. Civilized people have always hired someone to do the guarding, a sheriff, a police force, or some branch of government. Once law enforcement was in place, the people were freer. They could leave their property, work in the fields, and so on. In short, the proper amount of government makes everyone freer. There are some who advocate anarchy, however, not because they want no government, but because they don't like what they have. They use anarchy as a tool for revolutionary change. The condition of anarchy is very much like a vacuum where something rushes in to fill it. These calculating anarchists work to break down the existing government with rioting, killing, looting, and terrorism. Tragically, the people living in such chaos often go to those best able to put an end to it and beg them to take over and restore order. And who is best able to put an end to the chaos? The very people who started it. The anarchists who created the problem then created government run by them, an oligarchy, where they have total power. This is exactly what happened in Russia that led to Lenin taking total power, and in Germany, where Hitler's brown shirts created the chaos that brought him to power. But anarchy isn't a stable form of government. It's a quick transition from something that exists to something desired by the power hungry. It's a temporary condition, and because it isn't permanent, we eliminate it as well. The word democracy comes from two Greek words, demos meaning people, and kratian meaning to rule. Democracy, therefore, means the rule of the people, majority rule. This, of course, sounds good, but suppose the majority decides to take away one's home, or business, or children. Obviously, there has to be a limit. The flaw in democracy is that the majority isn't restrained. If more than half the people can be persuaded to want something in a democracy, they rule. What about republic? Well, that comes from the Latin. Res meaning thing, and publica meaning public. It means the public thing, the law. A true republic is one where the government is limited by law, leaving the people alone. America's founders had a clean slate to write on. They could have set up an oligarchy. In fact, there were some who wanted George Washington to be their king. But the Founding Fathers knew history, and they chose to give us the rule of law in a republic, not the rule of a majority in a democracy.
Why? Let's demonstrate the difference in the setting of the Old West. Consider a lynch mob in a democracy. <coughs> 35 horseback riders chase one lone gunman. They catch him. And they vote 35 to 1 to hang him. Democracy has triumphed and there's one less gunman to contend with. Now consider the same scenario in a republic. The 35 horseback riders catch the gunman and vote 35 to 1 to hang him. But the sheriff arrives and he says, you can't kill him. He's got his right to a fair trial. So they take the gunman back to town. The jury of his peers is selected, and they hear the evidence and the defense, and they decide if he shall hang. Does the jury even decide by majority rule? No, it has to be unanimous, or he goes free. The rights of the gunman aren't subject to majority rule, but to the law. This is the essence of a republic. Many Americans would be surprised to learn that the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution, nor does it appear in any of the constitutions of the 50 states. The founders did everything they could to keep us from having a democracy. James Madison, rightly known as the father of the Constitution, wrote in essay number 10 of the Federalist Papers, democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. To the greed, and he stated, we are a Republican government. Real liberty is never found in despotism or in the extremes of democracy. Samuel Adams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence stated, democracy never lasts long, it soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. The founders had good reason to look upon democracy with contempt because they knew that the democracies in the early Greek city-states produced some of the wildest excesses of government imaginable. In every case, they ended up with mob rule, then anarchy, and finally tyranny under an oligarchy. During that period in Greece, there was a man named Solon who urged creation of a fixed body of law not subject to majority whims. Where the Greeks never adopted Solon's wise counsel, the Romans did. Based on what they knew of Solon's laws, they created the 12 tables of the Roman law and in effect built a republic that limited government power and left the people alone. Since government was limited, the people were free to produce with the understanding that they could keep the fruits of their labor. In time, Rome became wealthy and the envy of the world. In the midst of plenty, however, the Roman people forgot what freedom entailed. They forgot that the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. When government power grows, people freedom recedes. Once the Romans dropped their guard, power-seeking politicians began to exceed the powers granted them in the Roman Constitution. Some learned that they could elect politicians who would use government power to take property from some and give it to others. Agriculture subsidies were introduced, followed by housing and welfare programs. Inevitably, taxes rose and controls over the private sector were imposed. Soon, a number of Rome's producers could no longer make ends meet, and they went on the dole. Productivity declined, shortages developed, and mobs began roaming the streets, demanding bread and circuses from the government. Many were induced to trade freedom for security. Eventually, the whole system came crashing down. They went from a republic to a democracy and ended up with an oligarchy under a progression of the Caesars. Thus, democracy itself is not a stable form of government. Instead, it is the gradual transition from limited government to the unlimited rule of an oligarchy. Knowing this, we as Americans are ultimately left with only two choices. We can keep our republic, as Franklin put it, or we will inevitably end up with an oligarchy, a tyranny of the elite. Just as there is widespread confusion regarding political systems, there is similar confusion in the economic arena. All during the 20th century, Americans were led to believe that there was a great struggle going on between capitalism and the communist world. Undoubtedly, a struggle existed, but the real adversaries were rarely identified properly. 
No discussion about economic systems will make sense without first defining terms. And one of the most basic terms in economics is capital, whose definition is the means of production. To illustrate what capital is, let's consider a very simple economy. On the sands of a small island, a castaway has just washed ashore. He has no food and he's hungry. He searches the island, he finds no berries, coconuts, or anything edible. He goes back into the water and tries to catch fish with his bare hands, but he fails. So he goes back up on shore, he finds a bush. He breaks off a branch, he gnaws at one end to make a sharp tip. Back into the water he goes, and with his spear, he catches fish. His spear is capital. It's the means of production for catching fish. He gave up some of his time and some of his energy to produce something he could not eat, but something that would help him to produce something that he could eat. Capital, therefore, can be tools, machinery, and even a man's handmade spear to catch fish. Such being the case, consider the communists in the former Soviet Union, as well as in China and Cuba, have always used tools and machinery. Officials there even view people as capital. Therefore, by strict definition, are not communists capitalists? For that matter, isn't everyone a capitalist? And so, is not every economic system a capitalist system? What then is the difference between what the communist system is and what the American capitalist system is supposed to be? The difference is ownership of the capital. Is the system monopolistic, state-controlled capitalism? Or is it competitive, free enterprise capitalism? It is between these two opposing economic systems that a battle has always raged. Before we proceed, let's also define free market. Basically, it's a self-regulating system in which all parties are completely free to transact with one another. But where force, fraud, or injury damages one party, the government's role is only to punish those who commit such offenses and to vindicate the rights of the other party. This protects the integrity of the free market, or free enterprise system, without intervening in it. The term private property also needs clarification, for private ownership and control of property is a key component in the free enterprise system. In order for ownership of property to be full and complete, all four of its aspects must be met. These are title, control, use, and the ability to dispose of what a person owns. In a free market economy, these aspects are unrestrained, so long as the owner does not infringe on the legitimate rights and claims of others. True ownership of property and freedom go hand in hand. They always have. Now let's compare the two systems of capitalism. In the competitive free enterprise system, capital or property is both owned privately and controlled privately. In the monopolistic system, holding title to capital can be accomplished privately or by the state. But more importantly, capital is controlled by the state or by the elite few who control the state. The Communist Manifesto, which contains the basic program for all communists and all socialists, explicitly preaches the destruction and abolition of private property. Karl Marx understood the powers of controlling capital, and so have all communists and socialists who have ever looked, and still look, to Marx as their leader. State-controlled capitalism results in high prices and low quality. After all, why would a monopoly strive to improve if it has no competition? On the other hand, honest, thrifty, and hardworking producers throughout the world prefer a competitive free enterprise system for all. Here, low prices and high quality prevail because a variety of producers will seek to attract the widest amount of customers. Competition results in excellence and always has. Just as the political spectrum shows the range of government power, we can also plot the various economic systems along another spectrum. These forms of government control in the market stand in sharp contrast with a completely free market. In the last century or so, there have been basically four forms of state-controlled economies. 
all on the far left of the economic spectrum. Fascism, Nazism, Socialism, and Communism. In each, the government controls the capital. The difference among these is how much is owned or controlled outright by the government. <coughs> In a fascist system, the government doesn't own businesses on paper, but it does control them. In Mussolini's Italy, even though he didn't hold title to businesses, he told the owners what to produce, how much to produce, when to produce, where to buy raw materials, who to hire, who to fire, and what price to charge. The rest, he said, was up to them. The fascist system is more efficient than other state control systems insofar as those living under it think they still own their businesses. Shopkeepers concern themselves with maintenance on the machinery, employee relations, painting the building, and so forth. But the government controls owners through an array of taxation and regulations. Under Nazism, which means National Socialism, its proponents went one step further and acquired ownership of some corporations, such as Volkswagen. However, Hitler didn't seize ownership of other industrial giants. He simply controlled them just as Mussolini had controlled businesses in Italy. Socialism is where government officials acquire possession of major industries such as transportation, communications, and utilities in order to leverage control over the entire economy. Through ownership of these vital segments of industry and by creating government regulatory agencies, socialists gain control over virtually everything else. Finally, there is communism, the granddaddy of all in the economic sense, in a way, communism is more honest than fascism because all of the capital is owned and controlled by the state. There are no pretenses about it. Now let's combine political and economic systems because ultimately one never exists without the other. We see again that there are only two ultimate choices. A competitive free enterprise system in a republic or a monopolistic state control system under an oligarchy. A moral people have always been a vital element of America's strength. The Founding Fathers well understood the biblical teaching that righteousness exalteth a nation. They also knew that expecting a free market economy and limited government under a republic to endure without morality was expecting the impossible. James Madison cautioned that limited government alone was inadequate for our nation. And John Adams observed, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. George Washington stated, Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Yet there are people today who think that liberty is licensed and that morality is unimportant or irrelevant to politics and economics. But as Benjamin Franklin added, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. The alternative to Americanism is what has condemned most of the human race to live as slaves throughout the millennia. It is the idea that rights are privileges dispensed by an oligarchy according to the unlimited rule of men, that the state should control or own the nation's capital with all economic activity directed from a central power, and that morality is inconsequential, and that security is preferred over freedom and opportunity. Our nation continues to be steered off course, and the principles that led to America's greatness are being cast aside. The simple question for us is, do we continue to slide away from our nation's founding principles, or do we return to the kind of government we inherited? Time is running out for Americans who sense that something is wrong. They have to decide what kind of a country we shall leave for future generations. All that is needed is for a sufficient number of Americans to get involved in the fight for freedom and to return our nation to less government, more responsibility, and with God's help,
We were, all those charges were leveled against us. How many of you believe that the media is completely unbiased and that you always get... Why are you laughing? Okay. How many of you understand that the media has been basically controlled by the same people for 100 years in this country? Do you know that? 200 years. Yeah. Do you know that J.P. Morgan in the early 1900s bought 25 newspapers so they could control the American media? Do you honestly think that that changed when TV started? Well, guess what? Every, yep, every news outlet in the country picked up on that article, and there was a smear against the John Burt Society. That's why, and that started in 1961, that's why the folks that are a little older than me, I'm 60, so I'm between 60 and older, have heard some vague thing about the genocide. See, they don't ever come out and say that we're wrong, they just say we're racist. See, if I call you a child molester, you're guilty, aren't you? Probably so in this society. You see what I mean? And you know what? It's never been any different. It's never been any different. Okay. And so that's what, and, and you know, they did that because that was a typical communist tactic. It's called giving somebody a bad smell. It's like hanging a dead fish around their neck. Okay. So that went on until about 1966. And guess what? They were going to destroy the John Burt Society. And by the way, this was started at a meeting of all the communist nations. There were like 80 communist nations about a year before this article came out. And they said, we're going to get these people. We're going to stop this anti-communist movement in the United States. We're going to stop this. Guess what happened? We grew. <laughs> we grew. You know why? Because people like you, people like y'all, I'm Texas, right? <laughs> you don't just buy it. You know what? I must have had 15 people come up to me tonight and say, are you going to address that thing about the bread? Yes, I am. Thank you for asking. Okay? I mean, it needs to be addressed. But the point of it is, see, people would come and they'd pick up one of our booklets or their next door neighbor would be a bircher and they'd say, well, gee, he doesn't even own a tinfoil hat. You know what I mean? <laughs> this guy's an American. I agree with what he says. And they joined. So in 1966, there was a complete media blackout on us, and for decades, they wouldn't say anything about us in the media. Now, can we prove that? No, but that's what happened. That's why people that are a little younger will say things like, I never heard of you. Because they thought, well, we'll just make them go away. Guess what? <laughs> we grew. Anyway, if you want a really good little book, like this gives the whole history on it. I'm not going to give the whole thing because it would take all night. But this is two bucks for this little booklet. Please buy this and take it home with you. Okay? okay. All right. Our goal is to have a sufficiently informed electorate uh, talking about congressmen that keep getting put back in. That's a plague nationwide. Okay? The man quoted our Freedom Index, 52% or whatever it is his congressman, congressman does. Okay? That's, that's a Republican. That's a conservative. By the way, I have a new definition for you all for the word conservative politician. You ready? I want you to jot this down, as Charles Stanley would say. Just jot this down. A conservative politician is a politician that's conserving the last liberal victory. That's all they are. You know why? Because the conservative politician draws his line in the sand, and says to the liberal, you ain't stepping over this. And the liberal goes, <laughs> steps over it. And the guy draws another line in the sand and beats his chest and says, I'm a conservative. And by the way, they're all conservatives, especially at election time. <laughs> and they all are strong supporters of the Second Amendment. <laughs> OK? We're equal opportunity exposers. We don't care whether they're Republicans or Democrats.
Democrats or independents or the libertarians. They don't, none of it matters. It doesn't matter. And you are finding that out, aren't you? In 2010, the Tea Party got all, you know, did what they wanted to do. They threw out the bums. And what did they get when they threw out the bums? More bums. More bums. <laughs> they got the conservative John Boehner. What a guy. Suing the president. I'm an idiot. Yeah. He's not an idiot, though. Well, no. He's not. He's, he's doing the agenda. He's doing the agenda. That's right. He's following the agenda. We expose that, folks, and that's why we get attacked. We expose it consistently. We expose their voting record every six months. That Freedom Index comes out in our magazine. The magazine comes out twice a month to our members. The Freedom Index is twice a year. We take 10 key votes in the first half of the year and 10 key votes in the second half of the year. And we rate every U.S. Congressman, congressman and every U.S. Senator based on how they voted constitutionally because that's what they took the oath to. Not to the Republican Party, not to the Democrat Party, not to Chevy, Mom, or Apple Pie. They took a, an oath before whatever God they professed to serve to this document, what we call the Constitution. And that's all that matters. Let me tell you a little story and we'll get started with my other thing here. <laughs> I was speaking to a Republican Party function in Oklahoma because the chairman of the Republican Party in that county happens to be one of our members, and she asked me to do this. So I said, sure, I'm, well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to go and I'm going to try to recruit those folks. And by the way, that's what I'm doing here tonight. I'm trying to recruit you folks. So we'll get right up front with that. Okay. And no, you don't have to quit the Tea Party to be a JBS member. We're all in the same boat. Anyway, um, so I met this thing, and, and I talked about the Freedom Index. And a new Republican congressman um, had his staffer there. I don't know what the guy does, whatever staffers do. And he had to leave early. But I had talked about the Freedom Index. So a state representative comes walking up to my table, and he said, could I get one of those for Congressman, we'll let him remain nameless. And I said, oh, please do. <laughs> please do. Okay, because this is the conservative guy that replaced the bum Democrat. So this state representative, who's a good friend of us, right, he opens up the thing. And I know he thought he was going to score, you know, not the 100 percentile. And he looks at me and he goes, 70 percent. And then he looks at me and he says, well, What's a good score? I said, 100%. And he looks at me and he goes, well, yeah. See how he did that? Started rationalizing in his mind. I said, well, let me just say this. I said, did Congressman so-and-so swear an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic? Yes. I said, did you? Yes. Because everybody that's dog catcher or above that's in an office swears that same oath. Right? I said, let me ask you another question. I said, well, I said, so, so he swore this oath to this document. Is he, shouldn't his votes reflect that all the time? Well, yeah. I couldn't argue with me there. I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, are you married? He said, yeah. I said, did you swear an oath before God to be faithful to your wife? <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. I come from the Northeast, folks. Sarcasm is my spiritual gift. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he said, yes. And I said, well, I said, when you go home tonight and your bride comes and throws her arms around your neck and tells you what a wonderful man you are, say, you know, honey, I am wonderful and I am faithful to you seven out of ten times. <laughs> and I said, and if you're still around tomorrow morning, you call me and you tell me how that conversation went. <laughs> okay? Equal opportunity exposers. Why? 
Because is it more important, is your oath to your wife more important than the oath that they swear to the Constitution or less important? Have they read the Constitution? Most of them, no. All right, here's, here's the thing, and, and I pointed this out. You cheat on your wife, Mr. Congressman, and your wife gets hurt, and you get hurt, and you know, your church might be affected, and your kids will be affected, and there'll be some, there's, there's some fallout. But every time, every time one of those guys votes against the Constitution, every time, they steal our freedom and our money, and they're taking it away from our great-grandchildren. Because it'll take that long to get rid of this thing that we call Obamacare. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah. It'll take that long to fix this. Now, so when one of these guys says, well, what's a good score? I got a 65. <laughs> Don't listen to that. Okay? I'm not saying you got to go beat him over the head. But you've got, what has to happen to them? At some point, they're going to have to change or be changed. Which brings me to my next point. I want to talk about strategic activism a little tonight. <clears throat> uh, activism has to be effective. We can sit and we can go in 40 million directions and never accomplish anything. And by the way, that's, how many of you, do you understand that nothing in politics ever just happens? Without a committee. Well, before the committee, somebody wants it to happen. FDR said that. It's probably the only true thing he ever said. <laughs> All right. When you're dealing with a legislature, whether it's state, local, sorry, Mr. Mayor, state, local, federal, it doesn't make any difference, okay? It's because we're dealing with human nature, and our founding fathers understood, number one, that human nature is bad. <laughs> sorry, it is. At least I am. Of course, you already know that. All right. When you're dealing with legislators, <clears throat> I want you to keep in mind the word ear. We want to get the ear of our legislators. We want them to do what they're supposed to do. Okay? We don't have a lot of money. We don't have all the, the influence and the power. We can't offer them big shop jobs and this and that. But there are things that we can do. When you're dealing with legislators, you're dealing with three basic groups. Now, there's a little slop over, you know, there's, there is some crossover here, and, and they can change from time to time. You're dealing with the principal, okay? You're dealing with defiant, and then you're dealing with the mushy middle, which I call opportunists. And by the way, these groups are sized according to what it almost always is. What's the biggest group? What's the question they always ask? What's in it for me? Where's my freak? You got it, right? You understand. Okay. When you're dealing with the principal, we're going to go with the EAR, right? All you got to do with them is educate them. Now, we're talking about going and visiting your state representative, town representative, federal representative, whatever. Okay. Deal on the state level just because uh, I've got some examples from Oklahoma that I can give you on that level. The educated or the principal man or woman, all you have to do is, because you know why? Because they've actually read their constitution. They want to do what's right. So when you take a DVD to them on Agenda 21, for example, and say, you're stealing our property rights, we need to do something to stop this. They look at that and they say, yep, okay, you're right. They're, they're hurting us, they're, you know, they're hurting our Constitution, we've got, we got to stop this. You see what I mean? So they're pretty easy to deal with. They're also the smallest group. So you educate them. 
This group over here, the defiant ones, now they're not defiant in the sense of like a little two-year-old that sticks out his tongue at you. No, 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 oh no. No, they'll spend all day talking to you to keep you from going to the next office, talking to the other guys. They'll molly coddle you and all, oh, okay. how many of you ever gotten a letter? How many of you ever sent a letter to your congressman? How many of you have ever gotten a reply back, I'll keep your thoughts in mind? Yeah, yeah. How many of you know that's a lie? Yeah, that's what's down for them, you Right. It's a lie. My congressman is not losing sleep over my views. Trust me. No, don't trust me. Trust the Constitution. Anyway, okay? So you educate these guys. Defiant ones, that's the R. They have to be replaced. <laughs> because you're never going to change it. It isn't going to happen. Because they're in somebody's back pocket. Somebody owns them <clears throat> somewhere. Or they're just committed socialists or whatever. And there are socialists. You do know that there are socialists in your state government and your federal government. You know, red state, blue state, purple state. You're dealing on an individual basis with these people. Give me an example. We had a guy, uh, state rep in Oklahoma, who well, there was a sunshine law that we were trying to push through so that the, the state budget would be you know, published on the web, that portions of their spending would actually be out there. Can you imagine the peasants wanting to know where their money's being spent? I mean, what a bunch of malarkey that is, right? Well, this guy got this thing killed. He wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't hear this bill. He just wouldn't. Now, you've got to understand something. A Republican incumbent in Oklahoma. Enough said, right? This guy had never knocked a door. He had money coming out of his ears. He had all kinds of influence. The State Chamber of Commerce thought that he was the best thing since whipped butter. I mean, this guy was great. He was in like Flynn, okay? But he was one of these. Well, <clears throat> there's another organization in Oklahoma called the Oklahoma Conservative Political Action Committee, OPEC. And they are a PAC. Now, by the way, John Burt Society never stumps for a candidate or a party, ever. Our members are free. They can do whatever they want. Okay? And some of them do work on campaigns. That's fine. But we as an organization, we don't do that. We're not political in that, in that sense. Anyway, two days before the primary, OPEC sent out a little hat, like postcard, you know, the half of an eight and a half by 11 size piece of paper with this guy's picture on it, exposing his voting record to all the Republican primary voters in his district. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in the meantime, OPEC had also located, lo and behold, somebody to run against this guy. He was 26 years old. He was a wealthy little entrepreneur. Money. He could speak. He was good looking. He was a great candidate and, oh, by the way, strict constitutionalist. So OPEC sent this thing out exposing this other guy's record and said, during the primary, please vote for anybody but him. You know how many opponents he had? <laughs> I think he's running a car wash now somewhere in Oklahoma City. But he's no longer a state rep. He's gone. After years. Okay? You see what I mean? Strategically, that was done. The opportunist. These are the, it's the mushy middle. It's the ones that are, you know, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Okay? We're only doing it for the children. They're always doing it for the children, aren't they? Not for my kids. By the way, I've got nine children. They're not doing it for mine. Okay, with the A, you advise. We had a situation. The John Burr Society has been opposed to a constitutional convention for a very long time, and we still are. 
Amen. Okay. We are right now about the soul organization. They're all on board with it now. Okay. But we know you don't rewrite something. You know, if, if the speed limit out here is 30 and people are doing 60, you don't change the speed limit to 60 because then they'll do 80. It doesn't make any difference. You understand that they're breaking the law, they're breaking the law, right? That's one thing. But anyway, there's reasons for this. I won't get into it. Here's one reason. Left and the right working together to rewrite the Constitution. Did you know that Lawrence Leslie, who's a homosexual uh, Harvard Law professor, helped to organize this whole CONCON movement? You're not hearing that from your CONCON people, from your supposed conservatives. Anyway, advise. We had a bill that one of our illustrious state reps put out there, a state senator put out there a couple years ago for a CONCON bill. Then he was asked to come to OPEC and explain to OPEC why he was doing this, because this guy was 100% on our conservative index. Otherwise, he was doing great. Just this one thing, he was off. He stood up and he said, well, the only organization that doesn't get it is the John Burt Society. I don't know if he didn't know that 75% of those people were birchers or he didn't care. But one of them was, and his name is Bob, and Bob is the Vice President of OPEC. He's also a section leader in Oklahoma City, and he also is not real patient with that kind of thing. And Bob is, he's a little bit, he's got like phosphorescent Irish skin, <laughs> glow in the dark, and he turns this unique shade of red. <laughs> when he gets upset, and the veins do this. And, <laughs> and he's throwing up his hand during the question and answer period, and the guy that's the president of OPAC is looking at him, and he's going, I'm calling on you, because if I do, you're going to blow this guy out the back door. So Bob said, you know what? Charlie's right. Instead of doing that, he got in his car, and he drove down to the Capitol, which is only a half a mile away from this luncheon. And he went and he found Representative Jordan, who was going to be the representative on the committee to hear this bill. He's one of these. Okay, and by the way, when you get done working with one of these, you need a bath. You want to go home and take a shower. Because you folks have integrity, and that's really, they don't. They don't. It's as simple as that. But they can be moved, and let me show you how this happened. Bob goes and he meets, and of course, Bob is down there all the time. He's down there all the time visiting these people, so they don't know him. Hey, Bob, how are you doing, Bob? Well, Representative Jordan, you've got a CONCON -con bill coming from Senator Southpaw over here, and uh, you need to stop this thing. We need to kill it in committee. You must not hear this bill. And so he starts doing the, what's in it for me? I don't know. I'm really, I'll keep your thoughts in mind. Bob turned around and he said, no, you don't understand. You must not hear this bill. And then he did the Paul Harvey pregnant pause. You all know what I'm talking about? Much of the story. He waited like four or five seconds, and then he said, or we'll have to take the next step. Now, Bob called me. I was in Texarkana at that point, and he was laughing so hard, I thought he was going to fall off his chair. <laughs> he said, Mike. He said, that man's body language went from this to <laughs> Because what had just happened? See, I come from the Northeast, and if somebody says, hey, we'll have to take the next step. <laughs> See, man, sure. It might be the last step, you know what I mean? It's a threat, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And that guy says, what do you mean, the next step? And he said, well, if you choose to hear this bill, you've got 15 members on this committee. He said, we are going to make sure that the constituents of each one of these members knows what you guys are about to do to the Constitution. And that representative stopped, he dropped his head, and he went, oh no, please don't robocall my people. Please don't robocall my people. <laughs> We can get a thousand robocalls in Oklahoma for 50 bucks. They're effective. We have one of the ladies that does our robocall is the mother of a previous Miss Oklahoma, and she's got this voice. And when she calls you, 
you are going to do whatever she wants you to do. And she starts off with, can you imagine? And if you want to talk to your representative about this, push one now. And it goes right to the cabin. We advised him. That's what we mean by that. And you know what happened? He said, you give me 48 hours, that bill will be dead. Guess what? <laughs> dead. Okay? That's the way it's done. Now, is it easy? No. It's not. But it can be done. And it is being done. We just need to do a little more of it. I want to talk to you about numbers, because that's really what we're talking about. The reason that your congressmen keep getting reelected in Oklahoma, and by the way, or in Texas, we had the same problem in Oklahoma. You know, they're scoring 60s and 70s on that index. They only stick it to us when it really counts. Again, remember, if you're faithful six out of ten times to your husband's ladies, it doesn't wash. You know, so turn it around, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Eat two off two. Five hundred. We know from experience that if we have five hundred activists, and I'm going to say birchers, okay, five hundred educated birchers that are dedicated in a congressional district. Average congressional district is 710,000 people. 500 is not a lot. We will flip that district. Now, does that mean, again, do we tell people who they have to vote for? No. What I'm talking about is 500 people that are going out and talking to their friends and neighbors using materials like this and saying, you know that congressman that keeps telling you that he's a conservative? Well, gee, I, you know, look at this record right here. You'd be surprised at how people change. And all of a sudden, they start when they start getting to understand what's going on, they start seeing, excuse me, they start seeing things like Overview of America, like you just saw, and they begin to get those principles and they understand how simple this really is. They begin to get involved. Why is 500 important? Because unless you're sitting in the middle of Idaho somewhere, thinking I'm Idaho, in a cave with your tinfoil hat and your 50 caliber gun outside, you know, and a sign that says no trespassing, trespassers will be shot, survivors will be shot again, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> unless you're one of those people, you know at least 10 people. At least 10 people that you talk to every day, every week. And every one of you, if I had to ask you right now, I'll give you 20 bucks if you give me a list of 20 names or more. I know everyone you could come up with more. Okay? What's 50, 500 times 10? Nobody in here is a victim of Common Core yet, right? <laughs> All right. 5,000. You do that one more time, and you got 50,000. I'm going to tell you why that number is important. First of all, you're talking registered voters because every one of you is a registered voter. You're here because you know what's going on in the politics. You know what's going on, so you're, you're, you've banded together to try and do something about it. Now, you get 50,000 registered voters in a congressional district that know the score. They know the principles. They know how these guys are voting. You know what's going to start to happen? Do you know in 2010, how many seats were settled in the US House of Representatives by less than 50,000 votes? How many seats are there in the House of Representatives? 435. 435. How many of them do you think in 2010 were settled by less than 100, uh, than 50,000 votes? Probably all of them. 70%. Okay. A lot of those guys ran unopposed. <laughs> now, I, 
I've got all the numbers stacked up, but that's the important one right there. Now, dream with me for a minute. Just dream with me for a minute. Let's say that these 199, they didn't. Well, let's just say that every one of those 199 actually had read that Constitution, and actually took their oath to God seriously, and actually were constitutionalists, and didn't play games with the truth. And when some spending bill comes down the pipe, they say, no. See, it doesn't take that many, by the way. I don't know how many it takes. But at some point, there's a tipping point, because what starts to happen is these guys influence the other ones, and they influence their constituents. Their constituents begin to influence other people to put pressure on the opportunists in Congress. And then things start to change. Why is the U.S. House the most important? I don't, you know, by the way, please, please understand me. Don't waste your time with presidential politics. It will not matter who gets elected in 2016. I'm going to make a bold statement. Mitt Romney was the designated corpse put out by the Republican establishment that attacks you and us to lose so that they can continue their agenda and work the herd. Now Mitt's going to run again. Oh boy. Isn't that exciting? He's been pro-abortion from day one. How many folks are pro-abortion? Go ahead and speak up. It's a free country. He doesn't. Well, no, I'm... It, he changes. It doesn't matter which crowd he's in for. This guy, he's been... His father was a bad guy. You understand? And before him, we got McCain, CFR member John McCain, Council on Foreign Relations. Beautiful guy. Beautiful. We're hero. Yeah, we're hero. The one that sang Bomb Iran. Remember that? I'm sorry. I had nine children. I had two boys. I don't want any of my kids going in the United States military to go fight under the United Nations. I'm sorry. We have been fighting under the United Nations since the Korean War. We have not had a legally declared, congressionally declared war since then. And we haven't won one either. If you want to say we won in Korea, I'm going to have to ask you why we've got 60,000 troops over there. And why that whack job three years ago sank a South Korean vessel, which is an act of war, and we did nothing about it. You don't even know about that, you didn't hear about it. Okay, these are the things, folks, we've got to get people to understand this. Now, when people said, oh, you can support the troops, yes I do, bring them home. Put them on the Mexican border, I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> Repel the invasion. He pointed it out. Do you know that La Raza calls it an invasion? They call it an invasion. You understand that? And by the way, do you know that your governor speaks for La Raza and stuff? You know, have you seen any of the YouTube videos where he went and spoke for La Raza? Am I stepping on anybody's toes? You've got to understand what's going on. We've got to get people to understand. This is the way to do it. Now, you've got to be organized. We have an agenda. We've got a handful of things that we've been working on for 55 years. Now it morphs a little bit over time, but mainly that the agenda stays the same. Do you understand that there is such a thing as a new world order? These people want to control the world. The United Nations is 180 degree opposite from the UN Charter, from our Constitution. Every senator that voted for that atrocity should have been tried for treason. Every last one of them. Okay. Our kids fight under the UN in wars that they're not allowed to win. Anybody here go to Vietnam? Thank you. You heard about the rules of engagement?
engagement, I'll bet, didn't you? Yeah. Oh, gee, you can't hit the planes, you can't hit the commie planes when we're on the ground. You can't chase them across the border. If they cross the street and they go like this three times, you can't shoot at them. <laughs> well, you know what? They're doing the same thing in Afghanistan. They're doing the same thing in Iraq. Our kids are not going to be allowed to win those wars. The John Birch Society, back during the Vietnam War, which is before my time, I mean, I was, I was in the protest movement back then. Okay, didn't know what I was doing. But nonetheless, they had a slogan. When are we going to win in Vietnam and why not? We were exposing this stuff then. Nothing in politics just happens. People, you want to know why we're attacked? Because we're the conspiracy nuts. You know what a conspiracy is? Dictionary definition? Two or more people, meeting in secret, seeking to do harm to somebody. Mm. What's a football about? <laughs> Y'all <laughs> read your New Testament, I'm assuming. When the Pharisees heard what Jesus was saying, what did they do? They conspired to kill. Exactly. We are facing an organized foe. The Federal Reserve is part of it. We've been exposing the Federal Reserve. That man just pointed it out. If we don't stop the Federal Reserve, that balanced budget amendment is the biggest bunch of bloviating nonsense. All that off-budget off stuff is never addressed, and the Federal Reserve is never addressed. Neither is it with these Constitutional Convention people, ever. OK? Folks, you've got to educate people. If we don't do away with that system, cut spending. Why not? They don't need to cut spending, they just print money. And the politicians love it. You know why? Because they can pay for those wars without raising your taxes. For what? Okay. I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask you all to join the John Bird Society. It's $87 a year. For a single person, it's $90 per couple, so spouse gets to join for a dollar a month. You get the magazine twice a month. You get our bulletin, which I got one in the car, shame on me. Um, you get that once a month. That's our marching orders with all the legislation that we're working on and all that kind of thing. We will organize a chapter. No, notice I'm not saying, please do not, we're not in competition with the Tea Party. Because you can still go after your elections. You can do whatever you want. We're asking for a core of people that want to get involved in real activism on a steady basis, hammering away at this thing every day. Okay? I'm going to ask you to join. I've got applications over here. What do you think? Anybody good with that? I'm good. <laughs> He's good with that. I like this guy. It's always nice to have a good guy. Can I borrow some money? Can you borrow some money? I can I If you and I do it, then it's called counterfeiting. All right. I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, do you have? What? No, I was just going to say. I mean, if, if you're good, if anybody has any questions, we, we yeah, can please. Them. I mean, I went over it because uh, it's my fault for late. So if anybody has any questions, let, let's let's do it. Local chapter? Not yet. There's going to be. Oh, is, it, is there a local chapter? We only need eight people to start a chapter. Let me tell you about that. Bayonne, New Jersey, cradle of conservatism. <laughs> what? Back in the 60s, we were fighting the Equal Rights Amendment. Of course, now I told you we hate women, right? You know that. By the way, I have seven daughters and a wife. I like women just fine. And I know that the two best things that you can say are, yes, dear. That's the last word. <laughs> Works out well. Did the last word. Anyway, during the 1960s, we were fighting the uh, ERA. And we were becoming incredibly successful in Bayonne, New Jersey. Hmm. Okay. In the middle of that cesspool, I guess would be a nice word. Anyway. The guy who was the coordinator then, doing what I do here, 
His name is Jim Fitzgerald. He is now the director of field activities. So if the phone rings and it's him, I'm going to answer it. Okay, he's my boss's boss. Jim Fitzgerald is the stereotypical Irish Catholic cop. He was a narc cop in Newark, New Jersey before he came on board with us. This was not his first rodeo, folks. He's, you know, I mean, the reason I say that is because he's stereotypical. I mean, he's about six foot tall. He still looks like a cop to this day. He can't do anything about it. It's all over. <laughs> it's a wonderful man, but he's got the ice blue eyes, and he just looks like he, it's, it's the stereotype is just there. <clears throat> okay? It's, it's funny. Anyway, he was the coordinator. The New York Times found out, by the way, the New York Times isn't crazy about us. They just published an article here a couple years ago saying that we were responsible. The radical John Burt Society was responsible for stopping Agenda 21. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love it when they start screaming. It's just, you know, because that's the media blackout that didn't work, right? They can't help themselves. Anyway, the New York Times sent a reporter down to this area to do a hit piece on us, basically. That's what they were going to do. And so he goes, he knocks on Fitzgerald's door, because, you know, yeah, he calls the office, and, yeah, yeah, this is the guy, go see him. So he says, Mr. Fitzgerald, would you please let me find out what you're doing here? He said, sure, get in the car. Drove around for a week. <laughs> okay. All over Bayonne. Everywhere they went in Bayonne, if they went into a store, they had our literature, I mean, it could be ladies lingerie store, and they'd still have, you know, our literature in there. I mean, it was it was everywhere. They had a conservative constitutionalist mayor, city council. I mean, and boy, they were just hammering that ERA thing. They were just hammering it. They didn't want any part of it. You know why? Because the ERA came out of the United Nations, just like every one of these programs does, and it was designed, of course, to destroy our families and destroy the order of our society, because that's what they do. They change society before they change the government. Anyway, this guy's blown away by all this. Now, this is Bayonne, New Jersey. This is not San Angeles, Texas, okay? Gets all done at the end of the week, and he said, Mr. Fitzgerald, he said, I, I can't believe this, what, what you've done here with this area. He said, I have to know, how many members do you have in Bayonne? Mr. Fitzgerald said, well, I'm sorry, we never divulge that information. And by the way, we don't. You don't tell your enemy how big your army is. And so he, you know, he was begging, you know, please, you got, I've got to have this number for the story. I mean, it's got to put it in context. And so here's Fitzgerald. And the reason that it's important for you to understand that he was a narc cop from New Jersey is because he starts blowing smoke up this guy's pants like I would have, I'd give 50 bucks to have heard this conversation. I promise you I would. Because he said, well, you're obviously a bright guy. I mean, you work for the New York Times, all the news that's fit to print, the most prestigious newspaper in the world, yada, da, 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 da. He said, I'll tell you what, why don't you give me an estimate, I'll tell you if you're close. <laughs> So the guy says, you got to have 500 members in Bayonne. And he said, I can't believe how close you are. <laughs> that is, that's a great estimate. You know how many we had? Eight. Well, Twelve people that were sold out. Okay. They worked. They worked hard. And they got it done. Now, that's what I'm saying. For with, you know, eight people to start a chapter, I would not start one chapter. If everybody here joined tonight, we'd probably start two or three different chapters. Most likely, if we have the leadership to, to lead them. And we can help you with that all the way. Okay? Anything else? I'm having fun, I don't know about you all. I, I do have one quick, and I'll let you comment on it. If there's no other questions, you're talking about Agenda 21. Yes, sir. Uh, I know y'all work hard against this Transatlantic Policy Network. Uh, I'd really like to see our members sometime to look at a list of who's on there. But this Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership that they're working so hard on, 
This is on their roadmap. I'll just let you comment on this statement. This is straight from their agenda on the Transatlantic Policy Network. Lay the groundwork between 2014 and 2016. Lay the groundwork for eventual creation of a transatlantic assembly of legislators from both sides of the Atlantic to discuss mutual regulatory and economic concerns and to hold account the executives on both sides of the Atlantic. Right. Isn't that nice? Yep. <laughs> and what always happens, and this is what they, this is the big lie they told to the people that are now part of the European Union, you know, that used to be France and England and all that. And now they're Europe. <laughs> well, this is just an economic thing. It'll never be a political union. No, right. You're right. We're conspiracy nuts. Here's all the facts on those two treaties that they're putting up, okay? That's one of our main goals this year is to kill those things. Don't give this man fast track authority to negotiate this. And I want to tell you something. Your Republicans are all in bed with it, including Cruz. <laughs> Just saying. Any more questions? I want to know if y'all are on the, the uh, executive list of the IRS like we are. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's no more room for us. The Tea Party's got that right. <laughs>